homes and the care for the for-profit nursing homes as compared to the public ones, the nonprofit. Thank you again for the question. Uh, that is going to be on an ongoing basis in terms of the evaluation of all care uh, of all homes. And that is the system I referred to earlier, LTCF, which is a, a, a system that was implemented uh, in all homes in the province of New Brunswick. That data is provided to the Canada Institute for Health, Re uh, Health Research. Uh, and uh, that is what allows us to really compare outcomes or incidents, uh, health incidents across uh, multiple facilities anywhere in the country. Uh, so yes, that evaluation will be done, and, but it will also be ongoing. Uh, what we wanna do is, is measure anytime there's a change in policy or even adjustments in terms of operation, what is the impact on residents? And is there a timeline on when that's gonna be done? Or when we can start to see some results, I guess? Again, uh, based on uh, the six recommendations from the Auditor General uh, that we accepted all six recommendations, we've committed to having something developed by the end of this calendar year, 2021. Perfect, that would be wonderful. Um, we have two new for-profit nursing homes um, in Miramichi replacing the two non-for-profit ones um, that have been very well run over, the, over many years. When, um, when this had come about, we were hoping to have one nursing home with all the same staff and all the same residents run, you know, as well as the other nursing homes. Um, so it was a really big concern at the time for having it for profit, um, you know, in fear of, of less service and of less care for, um, for, the, pay, for the residents. Um, but it was pushed through at the time. And since then, many staff and residents have come that work in the same situation, worked in, this, in, the, in the previous homes and worked in this one and the residents as well. Um, and they have all felt the differences from the two and, and um, in, in a lot of negative ways. I've talked to many of the staff, I've talked to many of the residents. Um, we've had family in there who transitioned from, from the mount over to the new one. So we knew firsthand, you know, of, of, the, um, of the changes as well. Um, some staff have felt the impact of being more short staffed than they are, uh, more of a workload and a bigger building. And, um, you know, in a staff that was always had the problem, now they're, they're running half staff. They used to have four to five staff per floor, uh, now only has one or two, and it's a, and it's a much bigger, they're much bigger buildings. Um, they used to have an RN per floor of about 20 people, and now they have one RN a lot of times, especially when they're short, for an entire building of over 130, 140 residents. So the safety is an issue. Um, you know, residents won't ring the call bells because they know nobody will answer. They won't, um, they don't want to be a burden. You know, we hear that all the time from, from seniors anyway, um, but they know that the staff are not coming. Um, so, in these evaluations, who's, who's asked, who's questioned, and where do they get the information? Um, you know, is it people in offices, or is it, do they go right to the staff and right to the residents to find, to find their recommendations or their concerns? Thank you for the question, Ms. Conroy, and, and uh, what you express in terms of, of uh, your, your experience seeing a different level of care is something that is, is quite concerning. Uh, the standards for the province are, are uniform standards regardless of the financial structure of the facility. So whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit, the traditional model uh, versus a fee-for-service model, that, that is irrelevant in terms of the uh, standards that are approached. We have uh, liaison officers in the province that are trained nurses. Uh, that are, are responsible for looking after uh, nursing homes and working with them to ensure that level, that standard level. The system that I spoke of earlier, LTCF, is implemented in each facility. So not only will it allow us to see results from facilities in New Brunswick compared to the other jurisdictions, it will allow us to see outcomes in each individual facility in the province so that we can really see uh, the quality of care being provided there. So uh, 
that that's one of the things we monitor in terms of the information the other point that you asked is who enters that information that would be frontline staff that that would provide it to uh, likely a clerical person that would enter it into the system but it's the actual results so it's it's not a uh, it's not someone in the back office as, as uh, you asked it's really someone that is dealing with residents on a daily basis well we've had one of the nursing homes there for um, over a year now and they're, they're still running you know there's there's only one nurse for the whole building at nighttime um, two nurses for a whole building during the day um, so who makes sure that they are running to the numbers that are suggested or required by the province that again would be the liaison officer that's responsible for the um, for the inspection uh, of the facility as well as the the ongoing uh, conversations with them i mentioned many times to um to different people in the department or or in government about um you know going in and unannounced unplanned and nobody know you're there and sit in with a patient and ring a bell and and find out firsthand how long it takes that a nurse is able to come where she probably has three or four other people that have already rung the bell and working alone that can't get to them. Um, so in their evaluations, how, is, how, are they evalu how do they evaluate to make sure to see what this has done in a home? Again, I, I will uh, refer to the liaison officers whose role is, is to go, uh, part of it is also going into the facilities unannounced and I ensuring those situations that you just uh, spoke of uh, looking into those uh, just the, the same way you are. Uh, the other aspect is that the care is provided by a variety of, of professionals, not just registered nurses, but also licensed practical nurses and resident attendants or uh, personal support workers. So uh, it's ensuring that the complement of services or the personnel that is there is able to provide the services. Thank you for responding and we were talking about the shortage of staff and the differences of staff from the for-profits or the non-profits to the for-profits um, and and you mentioned in your response a number of, of PSWs and LPNs and and along with the RNs and they've all um, we've seen a difference <clears throat> um, and a decrease in that as well we're going from four to five or three to four LPNs and PSWs now down to one uh, with one floating from you know one floor to the next and the two different sections not being able to see each other um, so it's creating a lot of a lot of problems and uh, and and safety issues with the staff um, and we talked about the evaluations and unexpected drop-ins uh, and you said that they were being done can you elaborate on that can you um, how often are they being done and um, can you tell me some of the uh, some of what was found in these uh, in these evaluations Thank you for the question, Ms. Conroy. Uh, in terms of the liaison officers specifically, uh, there's the annual inspection, but there's also ongoing uh, site visits, whether it's a concerns that are raised by family members, by residents, or by staff. Uh, so I can't really quantify because it would be, it could be uh, once a week, as it could be once every six months. It really depends on the facility. It's episodic, as I would say. In terms of uh, when you say the, the significant reductions of staffing that you're speaking of, as I mentioned earlier this morning, the same standards exist regardless of the facility. So the standard in the province of New Brunswick currently is 3.1 hours of care. That would be the same regardless of whether it's a for-profit facility or a non-profit facility. Uh, and that would be a direct correlation to the staffing. There was no change in terms of the uh, standard of care to be provided in terms of hours of care when it was Mount St. Joseph or uh, uh, the other facility in Miramichi going to the uh, Shannix facility. Uh, so that, that time frame uh, is the same standard regardless. It's the same standard, but I, I know that they're not meeting that standard in the new building. Um, from being there and from talking to staff, um, when there's now at nighttime, there's one nurse, that's one RN that's covering an entire floor and there's LPNs that are scared and nervous and concerned about their safety from having one in one court um, with 20 people and the other one in the other court with another 20 people. Um, 
it, it is a, a big concern, and, I, and I, I really hope that something can be done um, to, to look into it. Um, with COVID, brings a bigger, even a bigger issue with the residents being alone and, and more stress put on the residents and put on the staff, um, you know, for the homes that, that can't see, have anybody in them. And the staff have been doing an amazing job of uh, Zoom calls and trying to, um, you know, connect them with the family as much as possible. But again, time limits on them, and it's, it's, uh, it's very hard for them to, to, to find the time. And they, they've always relied a lot on, heavily on the family to, um, to aid in the care, whether it be feeding or walking. Uh, and now, you know, they're missing that as well. Is there anything being done during COVID that, that would relieve some of these issues to help the staff um, deal with them? Thank you for the question. Uh, again, to follow up on the concerns that you're raising, we're gonna follow up with the home immediately uh, and uh, to, to ensure that any standards are being adhered to. In terms of um, the, the isolation over the last year, I will say for the residents in long-term care facilities has no doubt had significant repercussions. In, and I think for many of us, whether it's in our careers, in our work life, or whether it's in our, our normal just uh, society right now, the last year has been a challenging time for everyone involved. Uh, what I would say is that uh, at the very first phase, we purchased uh, iPads in order to try to allow for at least virtual connection with families between residents. Uh, we knew from the very beginning that does not replace having someone in your room to be able to visit with. Uh, but given the need to really ensure the safety of residents, <coughs> that was the direction it was taken. Uh, the other thing that was done is working closely with, the, with public health in terms of designing uh, visitations, but primarily specifically designated care providers, which tend to be family members, to be able to go and be with their their uh, their loved one within a long-term care facility. Uh, the point that you raise about families fulfilling a very critical role in the care of seniors in homes is, is completely agreed with. Uh, that is a, a care factor that is next to impossible to replace. Uh, so we are we are quite hopeful, and it's why the, the province has really prioritized vaccinating seniors in long-term care facilities. And the hope is to finish that within the next month or so, uh, so that we can uh, allow family members uh, easier access to facilities and to be able to care and be with their loved ones. Oh, I completely agree, and not only the the physical um, aid, but all, also the mental of 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 being there alone and, and I'm sure many of them feel that they've been completely abandoned. I know when, when our uncle was in, um, he passed away before the, not long before the, the COVID started. So, um, you know, we've thought many times that how he would be and he, he never really liked it being in there anyway. So how, um, how much more difficult it would be if, if we weren't there. So um, I can't imagine what they're, what they're going through. Um, when we talk about the care and, and being in there alone with family members, um, not being able to see them, there's also many instances where, um, you know, there's a lot of abuse in nursing homes um, that, that are caught by the family being there or, um, you know, being able to, uh, to see it by their visits. And now that the homes, a lot of the homes don't have families to visit or are able to visit, um, is there, what's being done to ensure that, that that there's abuse and neglect that's not happening, to make sure that's not happening in the homes. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, admit very quickly, Ms. Conroy, when you say there's a lot of abuse and a lot of neglect, uh, concerns me quite significantly. Uh, if, if that is definitely not the system that uh, we are looking for, that's definitely not the partners that we have experienced in terms of whether it's nursing homes or adult residential facilities. Uh, there's a number of areas that obviously the province uh, has implemented and the liaison officers going in on a regular basis. Again, following all the infectious control standards uh, continues to be the issue. Uh, designated care providers. So again, making sure that we have as much interaction as uh, safely possible with residents in the facilities that they are in. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a licensing process that we are ensuring the care of our seniors into these facilities. And 
the province plays the role in terms of monitoring as best as we can. Uh, and I would ask is anyone that is aware of any issues of neglect, any issues of abuse, as you, as you mentioned, uh, that is why we have an adult protection program within the Department of Social Development that we would ask anyone that has any kind of concern to be in contact with the department immediately so that we can immediately uh, investigate. Um, thank you for uh, for answering them and uh, and answering about the uh, the abuse part and, and then that's looked after. Um, you know, I'm sure there's you don't hear much of the abuse, which is which is really good. But but you do hear the odd story. Um, and again, you know, kudos to the the staff and the uh, the nursing home workers that look after these people. That um, they do a phenomenal job and and they treat them like family. Um, and we've seen it a lot in the past. Um, you know, there's concerns with the privatization, and that remains a concern with a lot of people. Um, there's some things that government shouldn't have a have a hand on, or that can be privatized. But, but uh, senior care, I don't think, is, is certainly not one of them. Um, so, um, the Mount St. Joseph uh, had recently closed. They've uh, been able to um, reopen and and had some nursing home uh, memory care beds, and we've met about it a couple times. Um, they had applied for 36 memory care beds, um, and they had, they had gotten 18, and only half of them have been filled. Um, just my question is, I guess, is why, why they're leaving Mount St. Joseph with empty beds and not putting a push on getting uh, all of the level 3B patients out of the hospital? understanding is Mount St. Joseph had applied for 18 and that 18 was provided. Uh, I know we continue to work with them on an ongoing basis uh, to help support them. In terms of filling the beds, it would obviously require that people or seniors requiring that level of care are uh, are there in order to, to uh, move to Mount St. Joseph. And it is really incumbent upon Mount St. Joseph working in cooperation with the uh, local uh, social development staff, as well as with the local hospital, the social workers, the long-term care social workers to fill those beds. Uh, I don't have here the number of the 18, how many of the 18 are currently occupied, uh, but that is a cooperation between the three. Um, there are currently nine that are being occupied. Um, right now in hospital uh, in Region 7, do you know how many patients are Alzheimer's patients or that would fit the criteria? Oh, I'm afraid I would not have that information. Okay, and um, is there any way that you could get that information? Are there, is there patients waiting for memory care beds or? Uh, we will, I will follow up with the Department of Health and the Regional Health Authority uh, uh, and, and see uh, how many residents or how many seniors are currently in alternate level of care and how many have been assessed at requiring level three. Uh, so I'll follow up with uh, both and, and submit that information. That would be great. I thank you very much. Um, and in September, Mount St. Joseph submitted a proposal to convert another floor for memory care beds. Um, but they've received no word on this. Can you comment on where this stands? Uh, Ms. Conroy, I can confirm that we have received their proposal. Uh, we have not yet uh, finalized the assessment and contacted and replied to Mount St. Joseph. Can you give me an idea when that will happen? I would expect that is a matter of weeks. Perfect, thank you. I will pass that along. Um, we've been trying to get in Miramichi, we have no uh, addiction, long-term addiction services. We have no shelter. We have an amazing group now that we're working with um, that, um, that has started the works on the, on the shelter, as you spoke of earlier, uh, which is fantastic. Um, we've been trying to get a Harvest House put in. Uh, we have a business proposal in, uh, from Harvest House. We've been working with Harvest House in Moncton. Um, and working very hard to try to get that here and with an, an empty building in your possession um, that's been there for for over a year as well um, we're just wondering um, you know with the health minister putting out a report that the five-year plan with with um, you know wrap around services addiction services step-up housing mental health uh, for the next five years and we can do all of that um, in you know in just a month or two of opening that building and, uh, and getting that going. Can you tell me if it's been discussed in the department or uh, what has been 
if anything have developed with with the business plan that was sent in to you I don't believe that that proposal was sent in to us. It was likely sent in to the Department of Health on mental health and addiction services. I know we are working with the same group in terms of a potential homeless shelter. Uh, so that component, we continue to work with them. In terms of the ownership of the facility, all, all assets like uh, that facility are owned and co the coordination is done by the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, we are quite happy to help facilitate any conversations. Uh, but the Department of Social Development has no ownership or control over over those facilities. Okay, it was um, it was the proposal was sent actually by myself to um, to your department um, and to finance and to the premier and to DTI actually, um, and the this, the um, shelter part of it is actually another group. That's the the. Um, the transition of uh, the um, youth home, Memory Youth Home, is, is under that too. So that's a different organization. We'll be working with them um, with ours as well, with Harvest House. But I've played a very active role in the Harvest House for the last um, couple of years to try to, to get this going. So we're, we're looking forward to, um, you know, working with the, the, the Miramichi sh the shelter that will be opening and all the departments. Um, so it's just now finding a place. Um, so yeah, so if, if it would be great to, uh, to, to get that push forward and see if something happened. Um